Good evening. I'm Dan Colley, uh, the director of the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases here at UGA. And it's my pleasure to welcome each of you to this fourth lecture in the series titled Global Health, Voices from the Vanguard. This series has been put together jointly by Professor Pat Thomas and me through the benevolence of the Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism, who is Pat Thomas, and the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases, and the President's Venture Fund. Pulling this together with Pat has really been fun. And in large part, uh, that not only because of Pat, but is because of the extraordinary assistance that's been provided by Diane Murray and Anetro Mapp of the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communications with the support of Tammy Andros from the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases. And if you don't mind, I'd like to give them and the rest of the staff that have uh, allowed us to do this a little applause at this point. Now, some of you know that this lecture series, because I've said it several times, those of you who have been before, is built into the uh, UGA framework for global health proposal that we've sent to the NIH. Um, we don't know whether that's going to be funded because it's the NIH and it'll still be three months before it even gets reviewed. Uh, but we think that the, the series has, has served uh, as a focus for cross-campus interest in global health and varieties of global health activities have come out of it. So based on that belief, Pat and I are now discussing the likelihood of making this an established lectureship here at UGA. So we hope that you will continue uh, next spring to support this notion by coming and participating and attending. Tonight, Dr. Scott Engel it will introduce the fourth Voices of the Vanguard lecture. Dr. Engel is Dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, having come to UGA last August, uh, as did Professor Thomas, which must mean we're doing something right in recruiting. This has been a very good year. Uh, Dr. Engel is an internationally known, known soil scientist who has over 350 publications largely in the area of soil microbiology and biochemistry as it relates to increased crop growth. So I'm very pleased that he's joined us this evening to introduce the final speaker in this year's Voices of the Vanguard series, who is Dr. Tony James. And now I'll, I'll leave it to Scott to introduce Dr. James. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you this evening. This is, um, unfortunately, the first time I've been able to join you for this seminar series. I am being in the College of Agriculture. One of my jobs is not to be on campus, and so I spend very little time here, and I've simply not had the opportunity to join you for one of these, so I'm very happy I can be here today and uh, I listen to our wonderful speaker. As I look across the audience, I did want to take a quick poll. I'm just interested in who's here, and maybe this will help Dr. James as well. How many of you are interested, are here because you're interested in insects and other things that fly and bite? Okay. <laughs> Versus those of you who have more, have more of a public health perspective and are interested in why people get sick and how you get them better. That's a little more in that side, but you've got a pretty good mix here. I think that's really been the focus of much of your career, is looking at the, the, the intersection of uh, biology and, and human health. And, and because of that, you've have absolutely established just a wonderful reputation for yourself. I, um, you know, I've been familiar with your work for a number of years now because I've had a personal interest in this area. But let me go ahead and give you a little bit of background on Dr. Tony James. He has a, got both his undergraduate and his PhD at the University of California at Irvine. Uh, from there, he left the university and traveled to the East Coast to Harvard University, where he had a postdoc in the med school. He worked for a brief period of time in the Department of Tropical Public Health at Harvard University, and then he was to leave there in 1989 uh, to return back to the, to the California coast, where he is currently the vice chair of the Department of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry. 
Uh, as I said, he is quite distinguished in his career, many, many publications, many accolades. As I went through the long list which was given to me, I, I noted that he is a, a fellow in the American Academy of Sciences. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our highest scientific achievement in the uh, Entomological Society of London. He's a leading expert on uh, vector parasite interactions, mosquito molecular biology, and other problems in insect developmental biology. Uh, the goal of his work has always been to develop and define tools that would prevent the transmission of parasites from mosquitoes to other hosts, and he has been working more at the molecular side of trying to interrupt this uh, transmission than, um, uh, than on the uh, pragmatic side. Uh, Dr. James has particular expertise in the study of malaria, which I'm sure many of you know is, is uh, one of the most significant diseases on a worldwide basis and claims more than two, uh, two million lives a year. Um, today's lecture is sponsored by the Grady College uh, Night Chair in Health Communication and the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases. And with that, Tony, I'd ask you to come to the podium. The title of his lecture today, today is Victims, Vectors, and Vaccines. Let's give him a hand, please. Well, thank you, Dean Angle. Can you hear me okay at this? And I want to thank uh, Dr. Colley and, and uh, uh, Professor Thomas for inviting me to speak to you today. <clears throat> I'm going to speak uh, initially about uh, malaria as a disease and uh, teach those of you who don't know anything about it, a little bit about it, and then spend the, the last part of the lecture talking about the work that we're doing the uh, experimental aspects of it. Not too much detail, but enough to hopefully give you a flavor of what we're doing. <clears throat> In this first image here, this is a human blood smear taken from a child uh, uh, who, uh, at, the, at the start of the malaria transmission season. And for those of you who've never looked at human blood smears before, if you stain with Gimsa, which is a stain that turns uh, things purple, um, you shouldn't see anything. This should be a nice, clear field like you see here. And what you see are Lots of little purple fish, and these are the malaria parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. So this is a fairly easy thing to diagnose in humans, uh, at least in purple blood smears, because you see things that aren't supposed to be there. And uh, this is actually a very dramatic event when done for the first time. Um, malaria is a disease that's actually been known for a long time, even though it has been described uh, not by the use of the word malaria, as we'll see in a second, but the symptoms have been described for a long time. And it's understood that perhaps Alexander the Great may have actually died from this disease. Uh, several years ago, excavations in Rome uncovered a graveyard that was full of children. And these children had died apparently all at the same time. As a consequence, they were all buried together. Um, they are also buried with dogs. And dogs were the symbol of the dog star, Sirius, which meant that these children had died sometime in late August, because that's when the, con the, the that star becomes highly evident. And from the, uh, the particular epidemiology of these deaths, it was determined that these children likely had died of malaria at this time. So this was a disease that was, that was known a very long time ago. Um, this is an interesting quote. It gives you some idea of the impact of the disease on, on countries. This is a quote from uh, two Italian members of parliament. And this is actually 1898. So this is two centuries ago now at this point. And it talks about the impact of this disease on the countryside in, in, in Italy. And basically, they were talking about the economic impact, the fact that the disease itself leaves uncultivated 2 million hectares of land in Italy, which means that the farmers who are working in this area were, were too sick to actually do the work. And it poisons and ki kills about 2 million inhabitants at the time this was in Italy. So this is a large number of people. Uh, kills about 15,000 of them. And at the time, they said there's no other health problem so deeply linked to the prosperity of their country. So over 100 years ago, this was recognized that this this particular disease has a major impact on the economics of the country. This is 100 years later. And this is a uh, quote by the then Director General of the WHO, uh, Dr. Brentland, who said that malaria is the single largest disease in Africa and a primary cause of poverty. Every day, 3,000 children die from malaria. Every year, there are 50 million, 500 million uh, cases among children and adults. And the reason I show these two um, uh, slides and these two quotes is to show you how little has changed, at least in this interval, over 100 years of recognition of this disease. 
And this is a more recent quote by Dr. Regina Rabinowitz, who was uh, then director of the infectious disease program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and at the time was lamenting the fact that the world has yet to commit resources needed to control this preventable and treatable disease. And she was talking about this on African uh, Malaria Day at the time. Well, as you know, subsequent to that, perhaps you know, the Gates Foundation has made a very large investment in the uh, amount of, of, of research infrastructure and direct aid for the development of vaccines for the malaria parasites. So the situation's uh, improving considerably. So what we're going to be talking about today, is, for those of you who don't know, is to give you a brief introduction about what is malaria, why is it still a problem, what's being done to fight it, and what are the prospects for the future. And I'll talk a little bit about our work in this area when we talk about what's being done to fight it. So what is malaria? Well, this is a, almost a primer in, in, in the disease here. Uh, the, the digital name comes from the Italian meaning bad, meaning bad air. And this, this bad air was, was an association of the fact that people realized that people who lived near marshes uh, were more likely to get the disease than people who did not live near marshes. At the time, they didn't make the connection with the fact that that's where the mosquitoes are, and we'll see the malaria is a mosquito-transmitted disease. And so they just thought that perhaps this was an issue associated with the bad air associated with marshes. And those of you who have been near marshes realize that on certain nights they smell uh, very bad, right? Lots of sulfur compounds. So they, they thought perhaps that that was the issue and the disease got the name uh, bad air. It is an infectious disease. So this is, means that there's an etiological agent, something which actually causes the disease. Uh, for those of you in biology, it's an intracellular protozoan parasite. So it's a single-celled organism, eukaryotic, that lives within cells. It's vector-borne, so it has a biological agent of transmission. In this case, those are the mosquitoes. And it has a high degree of host specificity, meaning that there are lots of different t uh, species of malaria parasites, and, but they have uh, very precise, or often very precise, host affiliation. So the ones that infect human beings, for example, won't infect birds, and the ones that infect birds won't infect human beings. And we see here the three major components in, in the, the, the uh, aspect of malaria disease, the parasites themselves, the mosquitoes that transmit them, and a diverse human population. So in humans, we, we talk about the etiological agents. These are the things that cause disease. There are four species that are significant. The most significant is one called Plasmodium falciparum. And this is the one that causes the most disease and death. Um, a close runner-up is one called Plasmodium vivax. Um, Plasmodium falciparum is the principal uh, pathogen that we find in Africa and actually distributed through many parts of the world, where Plasmodium vivax is, is, tends to be found uh, in the Far East and, and also in uh, Central America. And these two are uh, cause significant disease and mortality in humans. And we have two other species, Plasmodium, Plasmodium ovale and Plasmodium malaria, which also infect humans, but don't create uh, the type of disease burden that we see associated with these first two here. And it's thought that these two are the older ones associated with humans, that they've been uh, associated with humans much longer than these two, and as a consequence, their virulence has been uh, attenuated. Um, if you're a par parasite, not that any of you would be parasite, but if you were a parasite, one of the most important things you can do is not to kill your host, okay, because that's where you live. And so when we look at uh, host pathogen interactions and we find parasites that don't seem to affect their host in a major way, we assume that they've had a longer time to adapt to the host. This picture you've already seen, but this is a really interesting picture of a human red blood cell without and with malaria parasites. So you can actually see that these parasites live within the red blood cell and they uh, basically uh, spend their life consuming, uh, this portion of their life consuming uh, uh, the materials that are in the red blood cell. Well, malaria transmission is complex. Um, it's transmitted by, at least to humans, by mosquitoes of the gen genus Anopheles. So there's only one genus that we know that transmits the human parasites. However, there are over 400 species of Anopheles described, and we know that 68 of them at least are associated with malaria transmission, and that 40 of them are main vectors. And so this makes it very difficult to think about genetic strategies because each one of these species is a different genetic identity. And we'll see how that complicates the circumstances in a little bit. But I've listed under here, which is unfortunately appears to be too small for you to see, a number of species that are major vectors in different areas. Anopheles tiami is a major vector 
in uh, Africa, Anopheles Stevens' eye is in, uh, uh, in India and Southeast Asia, Anopheles diarist is in Southeast Asia, Pluviatilis, Alamanus, et cetera. These are spread in other parts of the world. All right, so a few interesting facts. Humans are the only natural reservoirs of the four species that cause uh, disease. So there are no free living forms. You're not about to get malaria uh, uh, as a free living agent in, in soil or uh, in other circumstances. So the life cycle is very complex. And this is a slide that I put up with some hesitation. Those of us who work in uh, parasitology, there's almost a rule that you have no life slides. And I'm not about to walk you through this slide. It's not important. But just for you to understand that it's highly complex. If there are no free living forms of the parasite, it either has to be in the mosquito, which is represented by this portion of the life cycle, or in the human. And when you think about it, that's a pretty tenuous life cycle. You have to be in one organism or the other. So the point is, uh, of this is that, well, geez, it would seem fairly straightforward if all we have to do is break this life cycle, that would be a fairly easy thing to do. But it turns out it's not for one very simple reason, and that is there are a lot of people and there are a lot of mosquitoes. And that alone is sufficient to maintain this transmission cycle. Okay. I will right, talk a little bit about the epidemiology. Well, malaria is endemic to the poorest countries in the world. So this is a disease that is associated with poverty. And when we look at the distribution on this slide, the uh, countries that have malaria are known to have malaria cluster in these bright green areas here. And we can see that's along the equatorial area here. And they, this happens to be countries where there's a tremendous amount of poverty. But it also happens to be the places where the mosquitoes are. Um, if we think about some of the statistics of malaria, they're, they're absolutely staggering. All right, we have 300 to 500 million clinical cases a year. So these are cases where people um, have been come into a, a clinical setting and are diagnosed with them. Um, there are greater than a million deaths each year. So this is, uh, uh, you pre you'll hear statistics about 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. The point here is it's very difficult to get uh, very good statistics about the number of people who, who die with this disease because they're often in areas where there are other diseases. But we know it's at least a million. And when you work this out, it's, it's somewhere on the average of two persons a minute averaged over a year. And most of these deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa. One of the interesting things about the epidemiology of the disease is that when you're first exposed to this disease through the bite of a mosquito, um, it's often as a child. And we see what's called age-related prevalence in, in terms of mortality here. We see that the deaths are in people who are usually under five years old. Okay. And what this means is that children are, and it, it, the example that we're using here, the children are the most susceptible to this disease. And if they can make it through this first year of infection, then they develop what's called specific antibodies, the parasite rates go down, and they become protected. So what's important is that there's a, a natural protection to this disease if you can survive the first infection. Uh, a little information about the clinical stuff. Um, as we said before, children are the most vulnerable to this, this particular pathogen, but so are pregnant women. You have somebody on campus here, Julie Moore, who's been working on, on this aspect of the disease. But the symptoms of the uncomplicated malaria involve fever, malaise, fatigue, anemia, headache, and myalgia. And these are symptoms that overlap tremendously other infectious diseases. Um, there's a more severe and complicated form of, of malaria. Uh, it's office, often associated with this one species, Plasmonium falciparum, and it's characterized by what's called cerebral malaria, which leads to seizures, coma, and convulsions. It's more what we imagine the more classical uh, uh, severe disease to be like, and then a number of other systems, uh, symptoms associated with that. And people are, ha had at one point thought that they knew the reason why malaria would become uh, dangerous, and that has to deal with the fact that the parasites have the ability to cause cells to sequester in vasculature, and as a consequence will cause uh, uh, conditions that lead to seizures and coma. Um, this clearly happens with plasmodium falciparum, but there's some debate now as to whether or not this is the thing that actually ends up causing people to die. Economic impact, and I'll draw this introductory part, Economic impact is significant. Um, it's estimated that uh, the malaria as a disease slows economic growth by as much as 1.3% a year, which is highly significant. 
and that people who are live in malaria-free areas have a gross domestic product, product which is three times higher than those who live uh, in other regions. So there's an interesting association where we realize that if we spent anywhere from $1 to $8 on malaria treat treatments, um, we could have uh, a tremendous impact on the economics of a particular area. Unfortunately, the countries that are most plagued by these diseases do not have um, access to this kind of funding. And uh, we'll get into this a little bit when we talk about the drugs that are used to treat malaria and the cost of those drugs and why, why this becomes really important. But I want you to somehow, in your mind if you can, remember how much you spent on your last bottle of Advil, because that'll be important in just a little bit. I can remember that of 20 tablets, it's like, you know, what, six or seven dollars, something like that? You remember? No, no, somebody buys it for you. All right, well. <laughs> Advil's expensive. And if you look at total public health spending in some of the countries we're talking about, it's ten dollars per person per year. And that's for everything, okay? And that includes uh, maternal, prenatal care, et cetera. So um, when we talk about uh, drugs being expensive, that's going to be important. Okay, so we have a standard economic model uh, which talks about, uh, a classical economic model which talks about the fact that if we have economic improvements in a society, this will lead to better health. But the way this is being viewed uh, in more modern terms, we're starting to understand that if we have uh, that the new economic model actually feeds in both directions. That if we increase the health, care, health standards of people, we'll actually have better uh, economic growth. And there's a lot of work being done by an um, economist uh, slash public health professional, Jeffrey Sachs, who's actually looking at this. And so the new models of, of what's going on in terms of malaria and its impact on economics uh, uh, suggest that it's a two-way street here. Okay. Well, why is malaria still a problem? Well, it's a problem because the traditional approaches that we've been using to control it um, are, are, are no longer working as effectively as they used to. Um, in the old days, we had, in the old days being uh, 20 years ago and maybe longer than that, uh, going back to the beginning of the last century, we had a very powerful anti-vector measures. Uh, and these measures involve applications of insecticide resist insecticides. So these are toxic chemicals that will kill the mosquitoes. We understood that mosquitoes were vectors. Um, uh, we learned that in uh, uh, 1897. And ever since then, there have been efforts to control mosquitoes with the idea being that if you had fewer bites, you would have uh, fewer um, cases of malaria occurring. And as a consequence, then, reducing morbidity and mortality. And this turned out to be true. And the application of insecticides in controlling mosquito breeding sites was very important. Uh, we have here demonstrated two different approaches. And I, I put this up here as a lesson because this particular approach here is totally ineffective for controlling malaria, which is driving around neighborhoods spraying um, insecticides into the open neighborhood. And the reason it doesn't work is because the mosquitoes aren't flying around on the streets. Um, that old joke about why you rob banks because that's where the money is. Well, mosquitoes go into houses because that's where the people are. That's where they feed on. And so malaria control has to focus on actually going into houses and controlling mosquitoes that are in the houses. And there was a technique called indoor residual spraying, which this gentleman here is doing. He's spraying the inside of a house with DDT. And the, way, the reason that this works is that mosquitoes, when they come to feed on you or me or anybody who's in a house. It's only the females that feed on blood. And what the female does is she takes this enormous uh, blood meal. It's enormous in her sense because she's very small. The blood meal is about four or five times her body weight. And she can't fly very well after that. And so what she does is she flies to the nearest wall and undergoes a process of diuresis. And when she diuresis, she loses the, the, um, the fluid associated with the blood. And so you'll have this mosquito come in flying or be inside the house flying pretty accurately, working pretty good here, land on somebody, bite them, and then kind of, whoa, fly over and hang out on the wall. <laughs> so if you coat the wall with insecticide, all right, this will kill the mosquito. And this is a very, very uh, uh, powerful technique for controlling transmission of, of malaria. And we'll talk about this again in just a second. Um, the problem with this is that was twofold. One is that the principal insecticide that worked very well was DDT. And DDT, as we all know, 
has um, uh, significant and significant impact on non-target organisms. So it accumulates in the food chain and it's particularly detrimental to, uh, to birds who, who, who will accumulate uh, DDT. It makes their eggshells soft and as a consequence uh, uh, does damage to the reproducti reproduction of, of uh, 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 raptors, particularly birds that feed on uh, other animals. But the main problem with DDT is actually DDT resistance, all right? And that is the mosquitoes became resistant to it and it could no longer be used. Um, now there's some interesting issues associated with DDT. The fact that it was used in tons per, per acre to control in agricultural use um, was actually responsible for the accumulation of DDT in the environment. The public health uses of DDT were so minimal that they did not have a negative impact. And indeed now, the only sanctioned use of DDT left in the world as we exist now is for malaria control, and we actually need it as a powerful tool. All right. uh, one of the other things that came up of why malaria is still a problem is drug resistance. We knew from very early on that there were various plant extracts that could be used to treat the disease, the oldest one being uh, quinine, uh, which is a nice additive, obviously, for gin and tonics. But um, that developed out of the fact that in, in South America, the natives had understood that there was a bark of a tree called a chinchona that when made into an emulsion would counteract the effects of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the actual malaria uh, disease. Um, when this was discovered by um, Europeans coming to the New World, it was a highly guarded secret. All right? the, there were uh, uh, groups of, uh, of, of priests who were, who were part of the uh, colonial infrastructure who brought this secret back to them in Europe. And the reason it was powerful was that we showed, see, we'd seen before, there was malaria in Europe. And for them to bring back a cure to the new, from the new world to the old world uh, was very important. And very wealthy patrons would pay to have their children treated by these people who held this secret. And there's a very interesting story behind the fact that th this drug was brought to the old world and that there was an effort to control it so that uh, the people who had it ha would have a lot of influence and power. However, after it became widely available, um, resistance started to develop to it, and a series of new drugs were developed, chloroquine, mefloquine, fancidar, and doxycycline. And uh, the issues associated with this are the fact that um, we use them for a while, and then we see resistance. And there's an interesting set of slides here, which shows uh, the use of uh, various new drugs as they came out, chloroquine, uh, just after World War II and into the late 60s. It was 16 years before we saw significant resistance to chloroquine develop. As a consequence of that, though, we needed new drugs, and the drug Fancitar was introduced, but it was only six years before we, before we saw resistance to that. And mefloquine came on uh, in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, but it was only four years before we saw resistance to that. And the last one on here is a, to a to tovacone, and it was only six months before we saw resistance to that. So this is a very disturbing trend for this particular disease, and that is the drugs we have uh, invariably resulted in resistance, but the period of time that it took to, for that resistance to become evident has grown shorter and shorter. If I have the next slide. Um, uh, it's been estimated that we need a new drug every five years if we're going to just treat malaria alone by using drugs. So this causes a tremendous burden on the people who are attempting to develop these uh, drugs. There are other contributing factors to why malaria is still a problem in addition to insecticide resistance and drug resistance. And these include, um, well, this is a painful one, little private sector or commercial interest, okay? Um, no one's going to get rich off of making malaria drugs, all right? So this is something which is an impediment. Um, what it means is that drug companies are unwilling to invest the amount of, of resources that are necessary to come up with new drugs because they just won't get the kinds of payback that they're useful, used to getting uh, for the types of drugs that they develop. Uh, once again, the Gates Foundation is trying to take uh, a step in this direction by working with drug companies to guarantee them some kind of payback on their, on their initial investments, but that's not a very productive business model for making this work. 
decaying healthcare infrastructure. It's a painful fact that as societies have transitioned from colonial to uh, post-colonial, which they ought to, uh, uh, there have been decreases in the way, the way some of the societies have been organized. And as a consequence of that, the health care structure has fallen apart. This is a tragic situation considering that um, uh, the, the benefits of democracy, et cetera, to certain societies is obviously very important. Okay, but as a consequence of that, some of the type of management of healthcare infrastructure has fallen apart. And as a consequence of that, we've seen resurgence of the disease. And then political turmoil is always a, a recipe for something bad to happen. Um, if you have a healthcare infrastructure and you have political turmoil, turmoil uh, that is often interrupted. And I have a few pictures here that are supposed to exemplify that. Okay. So uh, the next sort of area you want to talk a little bit about is what's being done to fight it. So I've kind of painted a, a, a negative picture about malaria at this point. It's a very nasty disease. It kills a lot of people. And uh, there are some things that we used to have that work, don't work so well anymore. Um, do we just throw up our hands and walk away? And the answer is no, all right? We, we continue to try to do things with it. And um, so I'm going to quickly review some of the areas uh, of, of the types of things that are being done to currently fight it. And all infectious diseases, when people work with infectious diseases, there are three main areas that one works in. Um, the first one is, is diagnostics. And we'll talk a little bit more in details in just a second. But uh, diagnostics basically deals with trying to determine what it is that's causing a particular disease. And when we go back to the symptoms of malaria, we talk about headaches, fevers, uh, muscle aches, et cetera. Most of you who have had the flu or a bad cold will recognize that those symptoms overlap bad colds and ba bad flus, et cetera, all right? So infectious disease, the, the types of symptoms that one has with infectious diseases overlap one another quite a bit. Right? Unless you can go in and make a definitive diagnosis and say, yes, there is this particular pathogen there or this particular parasite there, um, it's very difficult sometimes to figure out what's going on. So diagnostics becomes very important. And if you talk to your colleagues or your professors or uh, members of the community talk with some of the scientists who work on the campus here and talk to them about some of the efforts they have. Diagnostics is very important, and they, they will attest to that. Um, and one of the reasons that diagnostics is important is because one wants to administer therapeutics. These are drugs that either cure you by eliminating the pathogen or um, uh, alleviate the symptoms. So they may not necessarily cure you, but they may make it so that the symptoms aren't quite so severe. And if the therapeutics are highly specific, meaning that the drug works for a particular organism, it's really important to know what that organism is. All right? So we can see this logical flow from having good diagnostics to good therapeutics. Um, it turns out for some of the things that you can get, um, etiological agents, nasty organisms, um, that the drugs that are available for them are pretty bad. I mean, you take these drugs, they make you sick. They have a very strong effect on your own physiology. And uh, so you don't want to be giving people drugs willy-nilly without knowing what they are. So diagnostics is very important and leads into the application of therapeutics. Ideally, if we had good therapeutics, you would take a pill and you would be cured. Uh, but very often, we don't get that kind of circumstance. What we get is a circumstance where we're just trying to control the disease symptoms. All right? We're not necessarily trying to cure the person of the disease because we don't have anything that works. Let's see what else I can tell you about that. That's enough. All right, prevention. Well, prevention turns out to be the most cost-effective way to deal with uh, these uh, um, infectious diseases. If you never get the infectious disease, then um, you don't have to be diagnosive or very expensive diagnostic techniques, or you don't have to spend money on drugs. And prevention, um, when working with infectious agents, uh, is as simple as not coming in contact with that infectious agent. So all these things that tell you to avoid certain circumstances where you won't get certain diseases, I'm talking to the students now. All right. It's, that actually makes sense, all right? No one's trying to cut out you having a lot of fun and everything, but if you don't come in contact with the infectious agent, you won't get the disease, all right? So that's really simple, it's straightforward, something to keep in mind, okay? And it works, all right? It's, a, it's, it's called a, 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 it's a dependency clause. You have to be in the same place. You know, the pathogens aren't gonna fall out of the sky kind of thing, or be on a doorknob or anything like that. All right. 
So prevention is actually very useful. And we're going to talk about two aspects of prevention in just a little bit. One of them dealing with not coming in contact with the infectious agent, and the other one dealing with what happens if you do come in contact with the infectious agent and the deployment of vaccines. So something that gives you a pre-exposure that allows your body to build up uh, resistance. How am I doing here? All right. All right. So. There are three very recent milestone efforts as we segue into the type of work that's going on in my lab that have been important for uh, thinking uh, and developing uh, novel ways to deal with malaria. And all of these are based on dealing with genes in the genome, right? Uh, and there are lots of different reasons why this is important. But I told you before that malaria parasites have a very strong host specificity that the types of parasites that infect human beings only infect human beings. They don't infect birds, they don't infect lizards, uh, primates, or other models that are mice that have been used. Right? And that suggests that, that genes are somehow involved. Both the genes of the human host, so that they, the, the genetic makeup of the human makes it particularly susceptible to a group of parasites, and the genetic makeup of those parasites. Right? There's something about them that, that allows them to grow um, in humans. And so the sequencing of the human genome and the sequencing of the parasite genome are major steps in trying to get our hands on those pieces of discrete information that allow um, this type of host-parasite interaction to take place. In addition, we have the genome sequence of the vector, in this case the Anopheles mosquito, specifically Anopheles gambi. And a similar sort of argument applies here. The fact that only Anopheles mosquitoes transmit human malaria and that the malaria is going to infect these parasites suggests that there's, there's some genetic aspect to this, some heritable aspect. And we're starting to see the impact of, of genetics and genetic tools and the sequencing of these genomes, knowing all the things that are there on the development of new strategies to control malaria. In diagnostics, it's as straightforward as ask, saying or asking the question, if you have malaria parasites, there ought to be malaria DNA there. Right. So that makes the diagnostics more straightforward. And so um, people are developing uh, uh, techniques that distinct, based on DNA, that distinguish malaria parasites from other things that would cause what are called febrile diseases, diseases that give you those symptoms that I talked about, the headaches, fever, et cetera. All right. If that's caused by influenza virus, you ought to find the evidence of the influenza genome there. If it's caused by malaria parasites, you ought to be able to find evidence for that. And so this is being developed there. And there are a number of different tests that are, people are trying to develop, um, and they're called rapid uh, development of rapid diagnostic tests, RDTs, and um, uh, basically a, a, a number of different assays are being developed. Most of those of you undergraduates have done laboratories where you've looked at DNA. This is a, a gel electrophoresis of DNA, and you can see it. And this is a dipstick test based on that. And the idea is to see if you could come up with a rapid way to uh, tell, tell if a person has um, uh, malaria. The gold standard is that blood smear that we've been seeing over and over and over again. If you take a blood smear and you see those parasites there, then you know a person inf is infected. Um, this isn't perfect, okay, but um, it, it's, it's a start in this direction. Therapeutics, um, this is that quote I talked talk about, that a, a new drug must be available every five years. Genomics has actually been very useful here because we can study biological pathways that are present in the, in the parasite that we don't find in the human. And then we can ask the question, can we find drugs that will affect those biochemical pathways uh, that exist only in the parasite and therefore won't have an impact on, on the humans? And so there's been quite a bit of work in this particular area. And I have two citations here uh, specifically relating to new biochemical pathways that have been found that are targets for this. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about prevention and finish off here talking about some of the work that's going on in our lab. Um, we do do work on vaccines. All right. So the principle, for those of you who don't know, the principle behind a vaccine is to expose your body to a, an infectious agent in a circumstance where that infectious agent won't cause severe disease. This allows your body to mount an immune response against that. So when, when you see the real thing, you're ready to fight it off, all right? You got a chance because your body's already been primed. And there's been a tremendous effort to develop vaccines 
in, uh, for malaria. Uh, and we'll see in just a second how those, how those work out. And then I'm going to tell you about some new anti-vector measures, to the, the work that's going on in our lab. All right. I put this slide in here just to show you that vaccines can be highly efficacious. And this is the, uh, uh, a slide that I got from uh, one of the, our principal vaccinologists, Victor Nusenzweig, and he put this together in a talk he gave. It talks about the power of prevention, the impact of vaccines in the U.S. And these are vaccines from a number of diseases, poliomyelitis, diphtheria, measles, rubella, mumps, and pertussis. And what happens to cases per 100,000 after the introduction of the vaccine? And you can see for polio that the number drops very rapidly. In fact, for all of these, the numbers go down. Measles is experiencing a rebirth here. But for the majority of them, the, the cases per 100,000 go way down to the point where most of the students in the room have no idea what a polio case actually looks like. All right. I'm actually old enough um, to have had classmates that got polio and as a consequence were confined to crutches for the rest of their life. All right, this is something that only the senior members in this group know about, but it's something which is not even on the horizon of, of, of the younger people here. And that's a direct impact of the vaccine. All right, so there's a whole major, what used to be a major disease here that is no longer part of the spectrum of your life as a consequence of the development of vaccine. So the whole point is, that, is to tell you that if we had a vaccine for malaria, we would expect to have this, this similar type of dramatic impact. And for malaria, we've got a number of possible imaginable vaccines. We've got a vaccine that, this is a mosquito here, it doesn't look like much at this magnification, but this is a mosquito that is feeding on the arm of a human and infecting a, a particular stage called the sporozoite. This is the infectious form of the parasite. And so a good vaccine would be a vaccine that blocks these parasites from infecting us. All right, that would be, in fact, that would probably be the best vaccine we could get. It's a complete protection here, if we could get that. But this alone isn't sufficient to cause disease. All right. So disease is not the same thing as being infected. Most of you know that, because right now, every one of you is, has, is infected with E. coli. You've got all these bacteria growing in your gut, but they don't cause a disease, okay? Um, so you can have an infection without having disease. Uh, where we see the disease is once the parasite gets into the liver and starts growing in the liver, it, it makes these forms which get out and start eating the red blood cells. We saw that picture. And this is where the disease actually manifests and where people start getting symptoms. So it's possible to develop a vaccine that protect, protects against the forms that actually cause disease. So this is one type that people are looking at. They're looking at the one that blocks infection, one that prevents disease. And then there's another group of people that are looking to prevent transmission. Because I told you before that this uh, parasite lives only in the humans and only in the mosquitoes and has to go back and forth uh, between the mosquitoes and the humans. So if we could actually make a vaccine that prevents the mosquito from taking up the stages that infect it, we, we can block transmission this way. Well, the good news is that people are working on all three of these. And um, it's a competition, sometimes friendly. And the idea would be that one would have a vaccine that would combine elements of all three of these blocking uh, uh, strategies and have something that works really well. Um, as corny as it sounds, all right, insecticide nets work really well, all right, very, very, very well. It's a very curious thing about the mosquitoes that transmit malaria, at least in Africa. They usually bite from like midnight to maybe three or four o'clock in the morning, all right, which is when you're asleep which is when it's easiest to bite you. All right? They've adapted to feeding on humans at a time when humans are least able to protect themselves. So it's these early hours in the morning. So if you ever have a chance to go to Africa and you're worried about malaria, the one thing you don't want to be doing is running around in the middle of the night. All right? The other thing you do want to be doing is sleeping under a net. Because right? this prevents the mosquitoes from getting to you. All right? and you can sleep under this net and they can't bite you and it will protect you. And in fact, they've done studies and they've shown that uh, you can actually reduce total malaria by about 17 percent and severe disease by as much as 50 percent when using bed nets. So um, these actually work. All right. So more advice for you, for those of you who are going to field. It's important to have a net that doesn't have holes in it. All right. 
Now, that may sound not like a big deal, but remember, the mosquito has all night, or at least the hours between midnight and, say, 4 or 5 in the morning, and then she can come back the next night to find that hole in the net, and they will do that. All right, if there are holes in the net, they'll just hang around there until one actually gets in. So you want to make sure that there are no holes in the net, and you want to make sure that you don't sleep up against the net, all right, so that it's right up against your skin. Because believe it or not, they'll land on the net and they'll just bite through. And one of the most interesting, if you're a scientist, and creepy, if you're not a scientist, things that you can do is wake up in the middle of the night, turn your flashlight on, and look at the outside of the net. It'll convince you to stay inside the net, that's for sure. At least it did for me. All right. But these work, and they work very, very well. All right. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what we do in our laboratory. The research in our laboratory is stimulated, I'm going to be talking only about this side here, which is genetic control of vector-borne diseases. It's stimulated by two things that I uh, haven't told you yet but turn out to be fairly interesting, I think. That's why we work on it, of course. The first is that not every mosquito can transmit every pathogen. We've already talked about that. We've talked about the fact that anopheline mosquitoes transmit malaria. Well, you've, you know about other vector-borne diseases. You've heard about West Nile virus. You maybe have heard about dengue viruses. You've probably heard about encephalitis, various types of encephalitis. Well, the Anopheline mosquitoes don't transmit those viruses. All right? There's a whole other group of mosquitoes that transmit those. And those whole other group of tra that transmit those don't transmit the human malaria. All right? So where am I going with this? Once again, genetics seems to be involved. There's a genetic makeup of a particular mosquito that allows it to be a hospitable host for a particular set of pathogens and therefore can transmit that. So that's the first observation, that not every blood-sucking mosquito has the ability to transmit every disease and that's likely a consequence of genetics. But it turns out to even be more interesting than that, and that is that you can take a population of mosquitoes, or you can take a species of mosquitoes that normally transmits, so say this Anopheles gambi that normally transmits human malaria. And with a little bit of work, you can feed that on a, on a, uh, 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 a source where it can become infected. So what do I mean by that? We can culture these malaria parasites in a dish, and if we're lucky, those are the types that eat the red blood cells, and you've got to constantly give them red blood cells. So when you're around a malaria lab, it's kind of nervous because there's all these people walking around with 60 ml syringes, which are the big ones looking for blood, you know. So um, you want to be careful around them. They're shameless in their pursuits. But they'll take your red blood cells, they'll prepare them, they'll put them in this dish, and the malaria parasites will live on them, they'll feed on them, and they can keep this culture going. Well, certain cultures will make the forms of the parasite that can infect the mosquito. And so you can take this, this, this blood from this dish then and feed it to a mosquito, and the mosquitoes will get the parasites. All right, that's a long way of telling you that we don't infect the people in our lab, okay? <laughs> you needed to know that. All right. Um, so when you do that, you can actually select those mosquitoes that become infected and mate them all together. And you can take the ones that don't become infected, mate them together, and you do that for a little while. And pretty soon you have two populations. You have one population that's really easy to infect and another population that's not so easy to infect. Now you can do genetics. You can cross them together and say, how does it behave? Is it like a dominant trait? Is it a recessive trait? How many genes are involved? You can actually start to map out the genetics of susceptibility, that is, those become infected, from resistance, those that are resistant to that. And you say, hey, there are genes that are involved. And indeed, there's a lot of science going on right now trying to identify those genes that make it possible for a mosquito to become infected and then therefore transmit it. When we first started doing this work, we weren't in a position to identify those genes. We started this work a long time ago. We didn't have the human genome available to us. We didn't have the malaria parasite genome available to us. And we didn't have the mosquito genome available to us. And we thought it would be very difficult for us to identify just exactly what these genes are. So we came up with a strategy, which is going to sound kind of crazy, but we decided we would just make a gene. All right, so instead of relying on naturally occurring genes that confer resistance to malaria parasites. This was in the late 90s, you know, or actually early 90s, you know, the, the arrogance of the 90s as we call it. Why not just make a gene? 
All right? We can actually put it together. And we thought, okay, that sounds like an interesting idea. If we're going to make a gene, though, what's it going to look like? So a simple molecular biology lesson for you is a gene can be thought of as having two parts. One part, which is the control sequence, the part that tells it when, where, how much to make. All right, so that controls it. And the other part is the part that's actually made, all right, the part that uh, is the product of the gene, so to speak. So we thought, well, why not just use this very simple model, define circumstances where we have control sequences that we want, and make something that kills malaria parasites. So that's what we did. And I'll show you how that works. All right, well, the first thing is this control sequence stuff. This is actually turns out to be important. Um, and so we have a little more life cycle stuff here, but it's actually pretty straightforward. I'm going to fast forward one because I think this is the picture we want. It wasn't immediately obvious to most of you that we, or you, what you were looking at was a schematic representation of mosquito. This looks a little bit more like it. So this is a schematic representation of mosquito. And what happens is this is, uh, this is a mosquito as if uh, she had been opened up and you're kind of looking inside inside of her, and there's a lot of stuff in there, and it's not important to memorize what this stuff is. But she's got a long proboscis, which comes off the field of view here, and she'll land on you, and she'll probe, all right? And that's a whole other lecture that Dr. Champagne here can talk about, uh, what's involved in actually getting a blood meal out of a, out of a host, because it's not easy. Uh, but when she gets that blood meal, it ends up here in what's called the midgut. So this is the first encounter of the malaria parasite with the mosquito. And if you think about it, it's a very different change to what it was used to. It was used to living in the human being that's a nice 37 degrees, 98.6 Fahrenheit temperature. The pH, the acid concentration in the blood is very specific. It's in that nice environment where it's living in red and eating red blood cells. Everything's great. And all of a sudden, it finds itself in the digestive system of an insect. Okay? This is about as alien as it could possibly get, it seems. So the, the first site of interaction then is this midgut. And if we want to go after the malaria parasites, why not put the gene that we're making, why not put its product in the midgut here? All right? Why not put it in the place where the parasites are? So that actually turns out to be a good place to go after the parasite. Um, and indeed, when you look at the naturally occurring resistance to malaria parasites, many of the resistance genes have as their phenotype, the way they look, the, the inability of the parasite to ever get out of the midgut. The mosquitoes basically ingest them, and they can't get out, okay? So this is something which is reflected in nature. But once they get out, they get into this open circulatory system, and they have to migrate to the salivary glands. Well, this open circulatory system is very much like yours and I in a certain way, and that is that the immune aspects of the mosquito um, often play out here in this open circulatory system. So we have the possibility of going after the, the malaria parasite where it's in um, this open uh, circulatory system. And then all of them have to make their way back to the salivary glands before they're transmitted onto a new host. Because what happens is the parasites get into the salivary glands, the mosquito lands on you, salivates into the wound site, and then delivers the pathogens that way. So basically, um, we look at these various tissues and we say, well, here are our opportunities to interrupt the development of this parasite. We have the midgut, the open circulatory system, and the salivary glands. So to go back to this synthetic gene we're going to make, what we need to do is find the control sequences of, these, of, of a gene that will allow us to put something in the midgut, the hemolymph, and the sal or the salivary glands. All right, so that's strategy one, is to identify the appropriate control sequences. And our hypothesis then is if we have these in an appropriate effector molecule, if we get this gene into a, 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 a population of vectors um, that, and we spread this gene through that population, we should see a decrease in the transmission of that pathogen, in this case the malaria parasite. Okay? And um, so that's what we tried to do. All right. So when we recognize this, we, we realized that we had several major areas of research and we're only going to talk about this one t right now, okay? For the, I have to give another talk tomorrow, and for those of you who are interested in this next stuff, we can talk about it then. But this has to deal with how we can actually make this mosquito, okay? And so the first thing we need to be able to do is we're talking about making a gene. Well, we ought to be able to put that gene back in. So we had to develop transgenesis technology. And this took a long time. 
took a long, long time uh, for us to do. But the idea here is if you're going to have a gene, that you want to be able to put that gene back into the insect in a way that it's stably integrated, meaning it, it goes into that mosquito and it's passed on to the progeny. And that means that uh, we, it can actually be spread to the population. We talked already about identifying control sequences that can express the effector molecule. And then uh, we have the actual effector molecule, the molecule that will interfere with the parasite. All right. Um, we have transgenesis technology. It works wonderfully with mosquitoes. This is just a little review slide, and it shows all these great mosquitoes with glow-in-the-dark eyes, which you might think might be an advantage, but probably is not. <laughs> Um, we have control sequences. This is a slide that just talks about the various kinds of control sequences that we have that would work with, with uh, the parasites. And this is a, a genomics display of genes that are turned on. This is 14,000 genes that are turned on and off. So we have lots of things that we can actually work with as a consequence <coughs> of the genetic, genomics effort. But I want to spend time talking about the effect of molecules for malaria parasites. Now, you want to build a gene that interferes with the malaria parasite. How would you go about doing that? Well, you already know that the parasite has to live inside the mosquito, and we already know that it invades certain tissues. It invades the midgut when it's ingested, it gets into the hemolymph, and invades the salivary glands. Well, the question is, you've got a single-celled organism. How does it know where to go? I mean, what does it mean to know where to go? So this is a single cell. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't even have a neuron. <coughs> It can't think about where it's going in the organism. So we think about, well, what's, what are homing devices for cells and stuff? And then we think about this concept of having receptors and ligands, all right? And I can translate that very easily for you. Receptors are molecules that are on the surface of the tissue where the, where the pathogen wants to go. And they somehow say that this is where you want to be. It's some molecule that's on the surface. And you have a ligand, which is another molecule, which is on the surface of the parasite that interacts specifically with that receptor. And when those two come together, the parasite knows, I gotta go here, all right? So you have this parasite in the middle of a mosquito, uh, or in somewhere in the mosquito. It's got this ligand, it's fishing around for a target tissue. When it finds that, it will invade. So if I wanna build a mosquito that's resistant to this parasite, one of the things I can do is interfere with the ligand, all right? I can interfere with its ability to detect that specific tissue. The other thing I can do is I can knock out these receptors, all right? Uh, nobody at all, so to speak, all right? I can, I can uh, somehow mask the target tissue so this parasite doesn't know where to go. So this simple slide here, hopefully simple slide, talks about if I want to make a mosquito that is resistant to a malaria parasite, one of the things I can do is get rid of this key or I can get rid of the lock. So I can interfere with the, with the receptors or I can interfere with the ligand. So that's one approach. And I'll talk about that quickly. The other one is to induce an insect immune response. It turns out that the parasites um, are susceptible to the innate immune response of the insect, the, the ability of this insect to fight off infection. And if we could somehow elevate it, that might work. Another way is to interfere with parasite gene expression. Uh, we talked about the fact that when the parasite leaves the human host and goes into the mosquito, it's a very different world. All right. And as a consequence of that, the mosquito turns on, sorry, the parasite turns on new genes. Well, if we could somehow interfere with those genes being turned on, uh, we might be able to affect parasite development. And the other one is just to secrete a toxin, all right, a poison. So the mosquito's flying around with this poison in it. When the uh, parasite gets into it, it dies off. That's actually not such a bad idea, but it's very difficult to find poisons that discriminate between the parasite and the mosquito. Now, some of you think, well, that's not such a bad idea because you want to kill the mosquitoes anyway. But the idea is we're going after the parasite now. And if we have something that kills off the mosquito, then um, uh, the strategy uh, will work in a very different way. OK, next slide. So what we did in our limited uh, approach at the time was we figured if we could block parasites from getting into the salivary glands, that is, we could prevent them from getting in here, they would not be transmitted. And we used a model system that dealt with this one mosquito called Aedes aegypti, a plasmodium gallinaceum that actually infects birds and galliform birds. We actually use chickens, though the guinea fowl there look kind of neat. And the parasite molecule that we went after is something called the circumsporozoite protein. 
And this is a lot of technical information about it, but the most important thing here are these pictures of the parasites here. And they're stained with a stain that shows us where this protein is. And it's all on the surface of the parasite. And some people think that this is a ligand for the parasite to recognize specific tissues in the mosquito. So we did a really interesting trick based on the fact that not all malaria parasites infect all the different kinds of species, all right? So we took an, a bird parasite and we put it into a mouse. And the mouse just laughed it off, all right? It's not about to get chicken malaria. I mean, it's a mouse. All right? So th what it meant was the mouse immune system was able to react to these bird parasites and mount an immune response and take it out. So we said to ourselves, why not identify what component of the mouse immune system is actually doing that? And so we did. All right. And of course, it was antibodies. And this is a picture of an antibody molecule here. It's got a heavy chain. This is technical stuff, but that's not important. It's got a heavy chain and a light chain. We're able to take the fragments of this gene that are responsible for recognizing that surface protein and clone them as a single product. It's called a single chain antibody. And what we've done is we make a very complex system fairly simple. We've taken something that requires two genes and we made it into something that now works with only a single gene. And we put it into the mosquito. So you need to think about what we've done. We've just taken a part of the mouse immune system and put it into a mosquito. So we actually have a mosquito that is now resistant to a malaria parasite as a consequence of it being mouse-like, so to speak, a true chimera. And it works. All right. And so I just want to show you one data slide. And it's real easy to follow through here. The experimental ones are these yellow bars here. I hope they look yellow to you here. And the rest of these are controlled. And what we have here are the percent of mosquitoes going from 0 to 100 percent that have a certain number of parasites. So 0 to 10, 11 to 100, 101 to 1,000, and greater than 1,000. And these three here, the, the white, the blue, and the green are controls. So the important thing you can see here, if you look carefully, is that there are, of the control mosquitoes, there are a lot of mosquitoes that have a lot of parasites. All right, so most of the mosquitoes have greater than 1,000 parasites. A few have 0 to 10, a few have in these regions here. But most of them have a lot. But in the one where we put the mouse immune system, we see that very few have greater than 1,000. And most of them are down in this, this area here. So if we look at this curve for the controls, most of them are way up here looking like this. And when we look at the experimentals that we made, made ourselves. All right. They look like this. So this actually has shifted the number of parasites from being a lot to being very few. All right. And this is the consequence of putting in this mouse gene against chicken malaria into this mosquito. OK, so the question then is, does this work? And here's where reality tends to uh, exert its influence on a very clever set of ideas, we think. All right. Um, when we asked if these mosquitoes then could transmit, we found this interesting result, which is that mosquitoes with as few as 10 parasites in their glands were sufficient to infect chickens. All right. So the inoculum is very, very low. And this turns out to be highly significant for this whole strategy, because the question is, how good do we have to be in order to make this work? All right. And here's our answer. We need to have zero parasites in the salivary glands if we're going to save chickens, at least. Okay. So how does this translate to humans? Well, it turns out that likely the same kind of target is there. And this comes from a very interesting set of experiments that would never be done today. All right. It turns out a long time ago that one of the ways of treating syphilis was to give people malaria infections, because the high temperature that people would get uh, when they became infected malaria, with malaria was sufficient to kill um, the, the, the bacterium that causes syphilis. So before the use of antibiotics, and unfortunately, long after the use of antibiotics in some portions of the world, people were actually infected with malaria strains to cure them of this disease. So this is, I'm going to walk you through this because this is a remarkable set of language that you'll never see again. It says, 11 patients requiring malaria therapy. All right, so what does it mean to require a malaria therapy? All right, these are patients. Are they signing off on this? Anyway, 
um, were inoculated with plasmodium vivax. Doses were 10 sporozoites in four patients, 100, et cetera. The bottom line is the minimum dose that they gave them was 10 of these parasites. Parasystemia, this is actually the blood infection, was detected in all patients. All right. So what we saw with our animal model with the chicken malaria is identical to what we can expect uh, in the human condition here, which is that our target is zero parasites. We have to get this down to the point where there are no parasites in the salivary glands. Now, as difficult as that may seem, it's also comforting because we know what our endpoint is on this. Okay. So that's, unfortunately, a, a quick jump into the science and back out again. Uh, but that's all we have time for today. So the future directions now that we're working in our laboratory is we want to move from these animal models, which is the avian malaria parasite, that chicken malaria, to the human pathogens. If we're going to work another five years, we don't really want to improve the world for the chickens, all right? It's the, despite all the wonderful uh, things that might come, it's a consequence of that. Our real object is to work on the human parasites. So we're, we're working with the human parasites now. Um, this is something which I can talk about tomorrow. I have to give a talk in, I think it's in entomology or maybe it's biochemistry. Um, uh, that it's great to have built these genes in the laboratory and obviously more work needs to be done to make these highly efficacious. But what we really need to do is conceive of how we're actually going to get them out into the field. And so this becomes extremely important. And indeed, um, uh, uh, we have a very large project that's trying to figure out how we're going to get these genes into the field. We're very much interested in the transmission dynamics of malaria in the field. We have this really crazy circumstance, for example, in some places in Africa, um, the vector, that is the mosquito that's transmitting malaria, is different between the, the rainy season and the dry season. So it's a completely different mosquito species. And when you're talking about a genetic control strategy, you have to then develop that for both species uh, during that, uh, in that particular area. And uh, we need to know what these, what these specific targets are. So our work is moving out of the laboratory into the field. Um, there's a larger agenda, which is not uh, particularly ours, but which is one, it's ours in the sense that our work overlaps that, but is one that's been uh, uh, mandated by uh, ro the Rollback Malaria Program by CDC. And this brings into play then the various things we learned about earlier on the fact that we should have insecticide-treated bed nets available to people. We should concentrate on, on, on developing strategies for dealing with um, uh, malaria in pregnant women. Um, we should continue to develop the drugs and um, hopefully try to develop some kind of technologies where we can forecast uh, the types of conditions that are going to lead to <laughs> malaria outbreaks. Uh, and these are some big picture challenges that I think how do I say this? You don't want to leave things to the next generation because that means you haven't done your job right. Does that make sense? <laughs> However, should we not be successful? Uh, there are some things that, that, that are probably likely to be available to those of you who are considering getting into the field. And is that I think we should consider development of a live vaccine. So any of you who are interested in this kind of stuff, we could talk about that. Because live vaccines tend to work very well. All right. Um, as you can imagine, I work with genetically engineered organisms. And the, talk of, and the talk about and thoughts of release of genetically modified organisms into the field is enough to stimulate very lively discussion. So I have a tremendous attack. Uh, attack is not the word I wanted to use. <laughs> yeah, we're attacked all the time. But we have a, a tremendous uh, 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 obligation to educate people what we're about what we're talking about when we're talking about genetically modified organisms. And so we can bring the public up to speed on why we don't, as scientists, don't think they're a threat, but why we're also in a position why we can't forcefully advocate their use, that this is work that has to be left with public health officials. Um, uh, I've had this discussion with a number of people. Um, we talked about the development of various avenues, vaccines, drug development, et cetera. Uh, to control malaria, and right and bed nets are also a good example. And right now we have successes in, in those areas, but they're not complete. They're, we get 30 percent efficacy here, we get a 50 percent efficacy here, but none of them are, are complete to the point where uh, we're seeing elimination of malaria. And this is a consequence of the fact that people who work in bed nets, work in drugs, and work in vaccines don't often talk amongst one another. 
So the one thing that would unite them is some concept that they're trying to approach eradication of malaria as a goal. Now, most people will tell you that this is highly unlikely to, to, to be achieved. However, I think the idea of conceptualizing it is something that will bring groups of people together who normally don't talk with one another, and perhaps we can get an additive effect out of all these different uh, approaches. And this was written on the slide before um, we got our Gates funding, but um, basically uh, the funding that is, that is available for malaria re research now is still insufficient. Um, people have made the comment that, well, you can't just throw money at a problem and expect a solution to occur. But I would like to point out that, um, that that's not necessarily true and this, this visualization of throwing money at a problem is incorrect. All right. Uh, H and I use HIV as an example of this. All right. When HIV was first started to be researched in the mid-80s, uh, it was recognized that it was going to be a serious challenge to people and it was going to be a serious public health problem. The National Institutes of Health also recognized that and invested a tremendous amount of money in, in trying to develop uh, approaches to dealing with HIV. Now, it is true that in the first series of grants, in the first rounds of grants, there was a lot of bad science. All right, there's no question about it. All right. However, those grants don't get renewed. So there's a five-year period where some bad stuff was done. Bad meaning that it was just, you know, not bad that people were hurt, but it was just bad science, bad ideas kind of stuff. Uh, you know, really uh, things that just weren't going to be worked out. But those don't survive the first round. I mean, well, they, they survive the first round, but they don't get refunded. So you have a bad idea, you know, and it's, it's something that's really important. There's a lot of money there. You'll get that first grant. But when it comes time to renew it, it won't happen. So very quickly, um, the, 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 this, this idea that you're throwing money out there and you're getting bad scientists as a consequence of that, just throwing it out there, there's, there's a mechanism for regulating that, and that's the renewal period. All right? So considerable money was, was put in that. And what did we get out of it? So this is actually something which I think is really important, and that is that you know, HIV, I had no way encouraging anybody to experiment with it in any fashion. You stay as far away from as you can. But I will say it's no longer the death sentence that it was 15 years ago. All right, for those of you old enough to remember what the, epi what the, the environment was like 15 years ago, 20 years ago at this point now, uh, diagnostic, a diagnostic uh, or a diagnosis of HIV was essentially that. It was a death sentence. All right? And it's no longer that way as a consequence of the fact that we have drug regimens now that can control the disease. So this idea that you can't put money into a problem and expect that alone to solve it is not necessarily true. If you put the money into a problem, you'll recruit good scientists to that and you'll get something good out of it. And I would like to argue that the same kind of investment in malaria will give us the same kind of results. And Jeffrey Sachs, someone I mentioned earlier, has estimated that that's somewhere between $1.3 and $3 billion a year. Which sounds like a lot of money, and if it was just coming to my lab, it would be a lot of money. But it's actually an overall uh, scale of things. Uh, it's not that much money at all. For that meager amount of investment, um, we could expect, I think, highly significant results. So this, this little line here still counts. And I think that's it. Um, thank you. <laughs>